Good morning, afternoon and evening, everyone who's joining us and welcome to our panel on the future of exhibitions in a post-pandemic world. I wanted to say a big thank you to the Louvre Abu Dhabi and to NYU Abu Dhabi for inviting us, to Manuel Rabaté and to Mariette Vesterman and colleagues for, for gathering us all here virtually to debate these very urgent topics and to all of you for joining us. Um, a special thank you also to Salva McDaddy and team for putting this together as well and contributing to it. And um, warm congratulations to you on the launch of the Arab Center for the Study of Art at NYU, something we're very excited about here regionally. Um, I wanted to do a very warm welcome also to my panelists. It's really an all-star lineup. Um, we have Chris Durkon from the Grand Palais, uh, Manuel Bojar Villel from the Reina Sofia, Amadi Bokum from the Museum of Black Civilizations, Hervé Babaré from uh, Agence France Musée, and Yang Zigan from the Shanghai Museum. I'm Antonio Carver, I'm Director of Art Jumil. And of course, ordinarily, if we were all gathering in the UAE um, at the Louvre, I'd be inviting you to come and see the Jumil Arts Center, but um, sadly, I'm now beholden just to have a virtual background, but hopefully we will all you know, meet in person at some time soon. Firstly, just a, a note of um, housekeeping. We have three languages uh, here today, so simultaneous translation into English, Arabic, and French. If you look down at the bottom of the screen, there's an interpretation button there that you can choose your, um, your language, uh, whatever you'd like to uh, listen into. We're speaking today mainly in English, but also with some French. Um, this panel focuses primarily on exhibitions, but uh, in our pre-discussion, um, Manolo pointed out that, of course, exhibition making cannot be separated from the larger debates at hand on policy, collections, and cultural production in general. So we have a lot to discuss and a very broad topic to take on, and such incredible expertise here on our panel as well, that we decided not to show presentations or images, but instead to tend, uh, take this time to really put our heads together to debate uh, this very challenging moment that we're living in and what the future of museums looks like for us. We have an hour for our discussion and then at three o'clock we'll be opening up for Q&A. So please do add any questions into the Q&A before three o'clock and we'll be taking questions at that time. So we wanted to start off by setting the scene. By way of introduction to each of my panelists, I wanted to start by asking each of them to give a short snapshot of the current moment that they have in their museums and their organizations and the country's uh, cultural scenes that they oversee. We're very lucky today to have representatives from the continents of Asia, Africa, and Europe. So we can try and take a little bit of the kind of global temperature of the museum and exhibition world. So just starting, first of all, uh, Dr. Yang Zigang is director of the, hi, is director of the Shanghai Museum. Uh, with his doctorate from Fudan University, he was previously Dean of the Department of Cultural Heritage and Museology there before joining Shanghai Museum as director in 2014. Director Yang is also the chief editor of the Sciences of Conservation and Archaeology and chair of the Shanghai Museums Association. So obviously speaking today with your Shanghai Museum hat on and taking a broader view of what's happening. I wanted to start on a really positive note uh, and ask Dr. Yang to open the floor because of course in March, just at the time that the Louvre Abu Dhabi and also Jamil Art Center and others in the UAE were beginning to close, that was at the moment in, in China, in Shanghai, that you were reopening. So you've uh, been reopened for eight months. And I wondered if you could just set the scene for us from Shanghai, uh, what you're up to at the moment, the exhibitions you have open, and how this past year, or maybe even longer, actually, has meant for you. Dr. Yang. OK. Uh, thank you, Antonio. Hello, everybody. Uh, I want to introduce some information about Shanghai Museum. The COVID-19 is an unprecedented shock to the whole world. Facing the pandemic, the state of our audience and staff is always the top priority of Shanghai Museum. The museum was closed from January 24th to March 13th for 49 days. We are one of the first museums that we open. During the closure, our essential staff maintained on site the safety 
of the artworks and equipment. They also carried out all antivirus measures inside the venues. Other staff worked from home. We launched our online program, including virtual exhibitions, digital correction, and other online resources so that the audience could still be engaged and visit our museum through the internet. After we reopen, we take several measures to make sure our audience can have a safe visit. All visitors must book their visits online, wear a mask, show the Shanghai Hills QR code, get a temperature check and a practice and the practice social distancing. At first, the daily entry number was limited to 2,000. Later, we raised the limit to today's 6,000 visitors per day. That's almost 75% before COVID-19. It's been eight months since we opened and all measures are taken strictly. We also shared our guidelines and practices with our international colleagues, including Lula Abu Dhabi. The pandemic, of course, impacts our plans a lot. There were three special exhibitions going when we closed the door, and they got extended after we reopened. Several scheduled exhibitions are postponed to next year. Almost all international personal exchanges are canceled. However, I believe that in such a hard time, it's more important than ever for museums to play its role because art has the power to unite. In July, we hosted the power of the museum's online conservation, where museum experts from 18 international cultural institutes gathered and shared their insights on the challenges and future of museums. Here, I'm very thankful to have Director Manuel Labat in the event. We all think that museums should stand together to unite the socially distanced world. As the situation in China is well controlled, we have made several exhibitions possible this year. In September, we, su we, su we, su we successfully opened the exhibition, worked with the Asian Civilization Museum of Singapore and some other museums in China to ensure the health of our staff and the careers from Singapore. We made very detailed prevention plans to make sure nothing goes wrong. This exhibition is still on view and attracts lots of visitors. At last, thank you again to Lugo Abu Dhabi and uh, New York University Abu Dhabi for having me in this webinar. It gives us more chances to communicate with each other and brings a lot of new thoughts on the future development of museums in the post-pandemic world. Thank you. Thank you. I think one of the points raised um, earlier was also, are we actually in a post-pandemic world or are we in a in the current moment or a neo-pandemic world? We can maybe come back to that. Thank you so much, Dr. Yang. Uh, now turning to Manolo Borja Bidel, I just wanted to, thinking about specific museums, I wanted to turn to you next, um, to travel to Madrid, to the Reina Sofia. Uh, Manuel has been, uh, Manolo has been uh, part of the, the Great Spanish Museum and its director since 20, 2008. He was previously director at the Fundacio Antoni Tapiez and at MACBA Barcelona. Uh, so Manolo has been engaged at the Reina Sofia for some time in searching for new forms of institutionality, something that will obviously come in very handy at this very kind of uh, moment of seismic shift. 
and he's been developing and reorganizing the collection and changing the method of presentation of works, something we can maybe come on to um, in a little bit. Um, Manolo has a directorial role, but he also curates numerous exhibitions himself, and he'll tell us more about what's going on at this moment at the Reina Sofia and how 2020 has uh, impacted not only on your own museum, but on the you know, immediate scene that you see in Spain. Oh, no, no, I think you're on uh, mute, so just to unmute. Now? Oh. Yeah. Thank you, Antonia, and it's a pleasure to be here with my colleagues and, and friends. There's people that I have not seen in a long time, so it's really nice to meet uh, everybody. So the, the situation here, first, uh, I mean, everybody knows, I hope, Reina Sofia is the home of Guernica, but is many more things. Uh, it has a large collection of historical Spanish avant-garde, Miró, Dalí, Picasso, uh, Juan Gris, etc., etc., and the collection is also very strong in 60s, 70s, and, and uh, contemporary with a very strong program of activities, a study center, several masters. We have 60,000 square meters, uh, meters and, and that's very important. Uh, one of our, our main buildings used to be a hospital. And actually was very much criticized when they decided to open a museum in a hospital. Now it's just the opposite. Actually makes all the sense symbolically and actually physically. So the thing is, uh, we close uh, like everybody else uh, from March, May until June uh, because we were totally in lockdown. And uh, we've been opening step by step. And let's say by the end of August, we in a way we were full activity, a full activity that has been different of the way it was uh, before in the sense that many people is working at home, in the sense that uh, we lost 70% uh, of our public. Basically, our public it was uh, local, it was schools and it was tourists. We have zero tourists, we have zero schools, and basically we have uh, local, uh, local people. So, of course, uh, like uh, Director Young, we have uh, uh, followed all the sanitary measures in terms of uh, uh, distance, in terms of people that can be in a, in a place. But uh, at one moment, we decided there was lots of pressures, especially from people that, let's say, has a more economist uh, point of view of, uh, of actually closing or actually because actually uh, uh, we are not uh, good for business, quote, quote, in the sense that we are losing money every time we open uh, the museum. But uh, this is where I think uh, we, uh, I'm very proud of being a public institution. I'm very proud that uh, public service should be reivindicated and that uh, there are other forms that we should find of uh, funding. So the way we, we did it is, of course, we lost, uh, uh, let's say, 40% of our uh, budget is private, 60% is public. Out of that 40%, 30% is tickets, restaurants, shops, uh, bookstore book, book that we lost. Basically, we had uh, almost none non very little income and but still we thought it was very important to keep the museum on we have now uh, like uh, eight exhibitions temporary exhibitions besides uh, the collection and uh, how we did it uh, we did it one is practical we push some of because also we are close some of the exhibitions forward so they will come to the next year uh, uh, budget we got uh, the support, uh, extra support of the government so to cover uh, the extra uh, expenses. And we thought it was very important because, uh, I mean, nowadays of the people that is now in, here in this conference, we might be here and in uh, several years, uh, the museums will be open, Guernica will be there, the galleries will be there. But what is very worrisome for us is the ecosystem and we, we are not only museums. I mean, we are an ecosystem uh, that surround us, which means artists, it means producers, it means mediators. And that in Spain after the crisis of 2008, 2009, it was extremely fragile. So this crisis, which is more, I would argue, is really like a catastrophe more than a crisis. I mean, capitalism is, 
is used to work with crisis, not with catastrophe, uh, has paralyzed everything. So for us, it was very important to keep uh, that alive uh, to, to, to support this system, which is very fragile. So that was one. Second, uh, and that was an argument against uh, my manager, and uh, we have much less visitors. But actually, my argument is actually that we have many more in the sense that the frame from which those visitors come is much, much reduced now. It's only basically Madrid. But this Madrid people is basically coming. We have lines, is coming. So that means that we are, they need us. That means that culture is now uh, more important than, than ever, perhaps. And the proof is that after the pandemics, like uh, everybody else, we move many things digitally. So, so now is, uh, and, and you know, they were very, very active. So that, that's the, the situation, and we hope we'll manage next year where the situation, I think, is going to be similar. We will work a lot with uh, the collection, but that doesn't mean uh, collection is going to substitute temporary exhibitions. Uh, that doesn't mean also, like some people said, that temporary exhibitions are over. I mean, after all, uh, before being directors, we are all uh, curators. We used to work with images. So I think that's very important. And we have to be careful, like we say in Spain, not to throw uh, the baby with the dirty water. I think it's very important. Maybe the format of exhibitions we were uh, dealing with until now is will not be operational, but exhibitions, I think, will be very important. And just to finish my presentation now, what actually we are doing now is uh, in this museum, we were very critical with uh, certain uh, ideas of what museum of this overproduction of events, of this spectacularization of uh, culture of is turning art into creativity, into an industry and through just some production into forgetting creativity. We are trying to uh, keep this moment to uh, rethink re uh, our, you know, what the museum uh, of the future or the, or the present, because the future is really here, because the machinery somehow stopped. So now is the, the moment. And basically, and just to throw it for the discussion, I would think that uh, first, uh, I would not just contrapose collection to temporary exhibitions. I would start thinking in long-term exhibitions that could come from collection, could come from temporary exhibitions. That's one. We should probably think in changing the idea of uh, visiting collections to the idea of, in Spanish, it's easier, habitar, uh, living uh, exhibitions, which in, it means other time uh, timing. I think that's uh, very important. I think it's very important that, and it will be like that because we will travel less, it will be less movements, that museum should be situated. That means talking from one place. Uh, that doesn't mean to be local or to be nationalistic, which I think is a, a very strong danger today, but they should speak from one place. I think museums should be, should be solidarious, as again also Professor, uh, the, uh, Director Young was saying, uh, we had this almost impossible Mondrian exhibition, which just opened last week. It would be impossible in normal conditions with the pandemics is almost a miracle in the sense that the loans are very difficult, but they happen and they happen because there is solidarity between us. And I think that's actually quite uh, quite important. So museums should be solidarious, uh, should be connected, it should be relation, should be situated. And especially, I think it should be, and I'm using a term that Derrida used in the 90s in the famous lecture of Strasbourg, it should be hospitable. And we are, we are a former hospital. It should be welcome. I mean, Ito Steyl used to say that uh, very often there is a kind of a structural violence in museums that has to do with uh, language that artists do not understand, uh, administrative rules that become uh, uh, good for business but not for creativity. Uh, and I think this element of welcoming, this element of being open, this, this element of the museum being like a uh, a, a church in the medieval ages, a place of refuge for creativity, for freedom, I think will be very important in, in the near future. Thank you so much. That was some really uh, excellent points that we can maybe come back to in our concluding moments as well. I'd really love to pick up on this idea of the fragile ecosystem and what the museum can do to support that. There was obviously uh, a moment during this uh, this crisis when people began to question 
the ways in which museums were spending money at a time when artists were really struggling to survive. So it would be good to come back to that. And also this um, idea about local attendance and the ways in which local audiences have embraced their museums and the ways in which we relate to those local audiences. And also this idea around events culture in our museums and how to promote a kind of slow thinking, but in a sustainable way where we can still all, uh, you know, command the funding that, that we need. And then two words for us to think about, uh, solidarious, which is also picking up on something that Dr. Yang uh, uh, talked about in terms of collaboration and the idea of being hospitable and the museum being a living entity. Um, so now I wanted to turn to uh, Professor Hamadi Bokum. Uh, Professor Hamadi is uh, uh, directs the youngest museum here today, but the one that reflects the oldest uh, civilizations in the world. Um, uh, as I said, uh, Hamadi will speak in French, so if you, if you would like to change your interpretation button, uh, please do. Uh, so uh, Dr. Bokum is the Director General of the Museum of Black Civilization in Dakar, Senegal, which opened in 2018. He is an archeologist by training and has served previously as Director of Senegal's Cultural Heritage and as an expert on UNESCO's World Heritage Committee and also on the African World Heritage Fund. Um, for more than 30 years, he's led major archaeological programs that have enabled the training of young archaeologists in Africa and has forged relations uh, between African, French, uh, sorry, European and American universities. And I think you have a lot of uh, colleagues here together on this panel. So, Professor Bokum, as a young museum, you were maybe best placed uh, to adapt and survive this moment. Um, but I wanted to ask how your museum and the cultural scene in Senegal and also, if you could just touch on the broader world of archaeology as well, how have you been affected by 2020? I think you're muted, uh, Professor. Bon, voilà, ça va, ça va bien. Voilà, merci, Madame. Alors, moi, d'abord, de remercier Abu Dhabi pour uh, cette uh, très belle initiative. Et naturellement, nous sommes très heureux d'avoir été invités à cette rencontre qui peut-être est en train de préfigurer ce que nous allons faire les années à venir. C'est-à-dire ce que nous sommes en train de faire aujourd'hui, peut-être que sans le COVID, on l'aurait fait in vivo quelque part à Abu Dhabi, en Chine, au Sénégal ou ailleurs. Bon, donc c'est la préfiguration de ce qui va se passer certainement les années à venir. Euh, c'est vrai que nous sommes un musée jeune, euh, c'est peut-être aussi pour cette raison-là, je pense que nous sommes en train de mieux résister au COVID-19. Je, je, je vais m'expliquer, euh, parce que notre musée a seulement été ouvert en, euh, en 2018, en décembre 2018. On a fonctionné plus ou moins l'année 2019, et puis début 2020, on nous a dit qu'il fallait fermer parce qu'il y a un machin qui s'appelle... COVID-19 qui est en train de faire des ravages. Bon, naturellement, on a été fermé pendant six mois. Ça a été un peu terrible, bon, parce qu'on était un peu sur la pente ascendante, ça se passait très, très bien. Euh, tous les signaux étaient au vert et vraiment, on se disait que, bon, pour une fois, on parvient à faire de telle sorte qu'en Afrique, on faisait venir le public local dans le musée. Parce qu'en général, ici, dans les musées, il y a les touristes qui viennent, euh, quelques intellectuels, les petits bourgeois comme moi, parce que la plupart du temps, c'était des musées ethnographiques. Et là, on avait essayé un peu de bousculer les concepts et de faire autre chose. Et on a eu jusqu'à 43% de visiteurs locaux, ce qui est extrêmement rare dans les musées ici en Afrique. Donc, c'était bien, tout marchait. Et puis, euh, le Covid est arrivé, il fallait arrêter. Euh, je, je, je dois dire que... La première impression que j'ai eue quand on a fermé le musée, c'est c'est la tristesse des objets. Les objets étaient tristes. Les masques étaient tristes. Les œuvres d'art, même plastique contemporaine, étaient extrêmement tristes. Je ne sais pas ce qui s'est passé, mais quand on les voyait, on avait le sentiment que ces objets avaient la gueule de bois. Moi, c'est la première impression que j'ai eue. Bon, on essayait de les soigner de temps en temps. On passait avec les conservateurs, nettoyer, enlever la poussière, mais... Moi, j'ai encore le sentiment que ces objets ont vécu une, euh, un véritable stress, euh, peut-être à la hauteur de celui que les conservateurs et les responsables de musées ont vécu à tous les niveaux. Et pour moi, c'est l'image qui va rester certainement 
gravé dans ma tête pendant de longues années, c'est la tristesse des objets, c'est la pâleur des toiles qui d'habitude sont éclatantes et tu as le sentiment tout de suite qu'elles sont devenues pâles et les objets tout de suite qui sont devenus tristes, on ne comprend pas. Mais je pense que dans les musées, les objets, les toiles ont besoin du contact avec le public. Sans le public, il ne se passe rien. Sans les humains qui viennent leur donner vie, il ne se passe rien. En fait, ces objets n'ont de vie, n'ont de signification que par rapport au rapport, à la relation qu'ils ont avec le public, avec les visiteurs. Et je pense que c'est vraiment ça euh, un gros problème. Et cette affaire de distanciation physique ou de distanciation sociale, il va bien falloir euh, qu'on revienne là-dessus. Moi, c'est le premier élément que j'ai noté. Bon, ceci dit, on a fermé notre musée pendant six mois. Après seulement une année d'ouverture, euh, c'était long, euh, c'était difficile parce qu'on n'avait pas encore de repères. Donc, il a fallu euh, essayer de naviguer un peu euh, vraiment euh, au petit bonheur de la chance pour essayer de comprendre euh, qu'est-ce qui se passe et comment se relever. Parce que quand on n'a qu'un an d'expérience et qu'on est obligé d'arrêter pendant six mois, vous comprenez bien que ce n'est pas facile, euh, c'est très compliqué, mais euh, on a regardé autour de nous. On a essayé de voir comment les grandes institutions se débrouillaient, que ce soit en France, euh, en Chine, aux États-Unis, euh, là-bas en Arabie, dans les pays du Golfe, pour essayer de voir comment les institutions qui étaient là depuis des années, depuis des décennies, étaient en train de prendre en charge de la situation. Et on s'est dit, écoutez, euh, on poursuit les, les mêmes missions, on va essayer de comprendre comment gérer finalement la relation avec le public dans un contexte de pandémie et de distanciation, disons physique pour ne pas dire sociale. Euh, donc on a pris du temps, on a pris énormément de temps pour essayer de voir comment gérer la situation, d'autant plus qu'ici qu au Sénégal, comme la, dans la plupart des pays africains, vous avez bien compris que la pandémie n'avait pas la même violence. Donc euh, déjà avec le public local, euh, c'était relativement facile euh, d'envisager le retour. Par contre, nous recevons 47% d'étrangers, donc des touristes, qui viennent pour la plupart du temps des pays européens, qui sont obligés d'être soumis à des tests au départ de leur pays, à des tests à l'arrivée, et qui sont peut-être plus fragiles que nous par rapport au nouveau coronavirus. Donc, on a beaucoup travaillé avec l'Agence sénégalaise de promotion touristique euh, pour essayer de voir comment mettre en place un protocole qui puisse nous permettre de faire respecter les mesures euh, basiques pour protéger les publics, notamment les étrangers qui vont venir euh, travailler avec nous. Entre autres, on a travaillé avec un cabinet, je ne vais pas citer son nom parce que ce serait la publicité, mais un cabinet très célèbre avec lequel nous sommes en train et nous avons établi un protocole. Conséquence, nous avons pu reprendre nos activités il y a juste une semaine, avec euh, une exposition avec John Wan, qui est un graffeur euh, euh, américain qui vit en France, qui est d'origine jamaïcaine, je crois. Ça s'est très, très, très bien passé. Et on s'est rendu compte, en fait, finalement, que le public était aussi stressé que les objets. Les gens étaient stressés de devoir vivre chez eux 24 heures sur 24, de ne pas se retrouver avec les, dans des espaces de convivialité. On a eu un très beau public. Euh, les gens se, se sont vraiment délectés. Tout le monde s'est amusé avec l'artiste, avec les œuvres d'art. Et je pense qu'après, en faisant le tour des galeries, je me suis rendu compte que les objets étaient presque en train de revivre. Ils étaient plus souriants, je crois, les masques. Et je crois que les toiles étaient moins tristes et plus éclatantes. Donc voilà, Donc, le musée est réouvert depuis euh, une semaine. On a une série d'expositions qui sont en cours. Donc John Wan est passé. On a un grand artiste sénégalais qui fête ses 40 ans. Ça va commencer la semaine prochaine. Et puis à partir du 6 décembre, euh, toutes les galeries vont être à nouveau réouvertes. Et nous avons vraiment espoir que ça va bien se passer. Euh, les mesures barrières, de toute façon, vont être respectées. On a tout ce qu'il faut pour faire respecter ces mesures barrières. Et euh, on espère que dans ce contexte nouveau qui s'ouvre, que de toute façon, euh, l'humanité aura le dessus sur le COVID-19. 
वाला सुख जी बुढ़ गए जी रहा हूं ना आपको मर्सी थैंक यू सो मच प्रोफेसर um and congratulations on reopening just a week ago that's fantastic um chris uh, chris dercon I'd, i'd like to come to you next as as president of the grand palais since uh, 1st of january 2019 Um Chris is for those of you who don't know is a Belgian art historian and uh, curator. Um his expertise bridges from the ancient to the contemporary and he has extensive directorial experience across many European institutions including the Witte de Wit, uh the Boymans van Bergenen, uh, both in Rotterdam, the Haus der Kunst in Munich, uh, Tate Modern in London and the Volksbühne Theater in Berlin. Uh Chris's role at the Grand Palais also includes running 17 museums under the umbrella uh, body the reunion uh, des musées nationaux so chris i'd love to hear more about uh, the grand palais but also your experience working with regional museums too at this moment thank you thank you antonio <laughs> uh, i'm glad you mentioned uh, reunion des musées nationaux which uh, some people are wondering about what does the reunion des musées nationaux have to do with the grand palais they became one organization uh, not so long ago but the reunion des musées nationaux stands for the association of french national museums uh, what's interesting about this is that we are working with exactly about 17 french national museums in the regions not only with these museums in the regions but we are regularly working together with museums in marseille but also in lille because the reunion du musée national grand palais is doing exhibitions at the galerie national grand palais which was a fantastic invention of andre maro in the 60s we are running programs exhibitions at the musée de luxembourg and we are even running as of very soon exhibitions at la villette in paris so we are confronted on a daily basis with this uh, major uh, in french you say effondrement melting down of exhibitions to give you one example the exhibition of men ray and fashion which we actually opened recently only recently at the musée de luxembourg uh, until everything was locked down again could receive barely 90 visitors at the same time uh, the exhibition of pompeii which we could hold until practically the very very end we could receive uh, and i'm saying only i'm actually very very happy that we could receive 210 visitors at the same time these are all figures they shouldn't be abstract but they tell us what we went through yet at the same time i'm very very proud that an exhibition like uh, Pompeii which was done uh, in collaboration with the Parque Archeologico di Pompeii and with Massimo Osana our uh, established uh, colleague who is now the chief of all the Italian museums yet this exhibition drew about 203,000 visitors in between two lockdowns I'm saying this because we were incredibly lucky. Now of course we had to stop everything including exhibitions of Marc Chagall in Nice an exhibition which is absolutely a very important one on Napoleon III at the National Archaeological Museum in Saint-Germain-en-Laye very important because it's about the invention of archaeological museums all these exhibitions are locked down that means they are still there and i liked what our colleague of senegal of dakar was saying indeed it feels a little bit like this uh, book nadja by andre breton you visit the museum at night and these artworks are becoming kind of ghosts i have to say that because we decided two weeks ago to continue the installation of the photo collection of the bibliotheque nationale which is our new exhibition at the grand palais and we decided to hang all the works when we can reopen we don't know but maybe we can use the exhibition to do something else to give you an example with pompeii we were actually one month late because we had to close the exhibition and then open one month later and we decided to make different digital versions of the exhibition online with the exhibition of black and white photography of the collection of the bibliotheque nationale we might do the same and maybe make a virtual exhibition I'm not saying that these virtual exhibitions are replacing the very 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 um moment of physical encounters and with other spectators of exhibitions but they add they add something they give back something now I must admit that the first confinement 
these digital versions of exhibitions are digital components were experienced by the audiences like an adventure, like a new playground. And we see already, and we have to admit it, just like in virtual art markets, that the public is not that enthusiastic anymore. We are, I'm not saying we are kind of fed up, but I think we need museums, many, many, many museums, in order to have these physical encounters with the artworks, but also with other visitors. And this reminds me of the fact that because of social distance and what I experienced in our exhibitions when they were still open, even with a minimal attendance, that more than ever we are becoming aware that there are other people visiting museums as well. That means we are not alone in museums. We suddenly feel that the museum is becoming a place a true place for encounters. And I was so happy to hear this morning that our colleague said that also a collection needs the public. So indeed, for the first time, I think, even if we pretended that we understood the public and the role of the public in museums, for the first time, we are really going to do something with it. And I want to come to that, is that we went since February, March, we went through many, many different crises involving collections, and involving exhibitions. There was the crisis of governance of museums. There was the crisis of ethical sponsoring. There was the crisis of representation, not only of the other, but also of women artists. Then there was the crisis of the economical model. Shipping costs are going uh, beyond everything we've ever seen. Uh, we have less and less visitors. How are we paying for our operations. We had crises like the ones we just start to speak about, which is deaccessioning in terms of we have to, we have to invent a new economical model. Then we have now a new crisis, which is everybody is encountering is saying, so are we still continue to upload endless digital content without finding and inventing a system of monetization. So it continues and continues and continues. We even are talking about post-pandemic exhibition architecture or post-COVID museum infrastructure. All these things which we were unconsciously or consciously aware about are very timidly speaking about before February, March 2020, suddenly we speak about a revolution of museums, of exhibitions. We even heard a colleague of the Louvre saying a few weeks ago that probably this will have an effect on the way we lay out exhibitions, we make exhibitions, we tour exhibitions. So suddenly all these things which were kind of taboo, we can speak about them and we are forced to do something about them. And I think that is that is maybe the only the only positive outcome of this whole crisis. We are aware that a museum is not just about works of art, but also about the public, about visitors and other visitors to be together. And we are becoming aware that we can do something about all these issues we have been raising in conferences and that we indeed have to change the museum. And I'm sure that suddenly we are going to be able not just to talk about it, also, but also do something about it. And I'm not just talk about restitution. I'm not just talk about open storages. I'm not just talking about, please, let's forget the name Blockbuster, because Blockbuster is so vulgar. By the way, the name Blockbuster came from the Second World War, isn't it? But suddenly we, 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 we know that we can do something about it. So that's, uh, that's uh, what we are doing right now. The most important thing for you to, to, to know also about our organization is that uh, we are raising um, about 80% of our own funding. So that means that in the Grand Palais, by the fact that art fairs are dead, are, are going to change, we have less and less income. The very good thing, and the very good thing is that we see that in difference to the Louvre or Versailles, where they lack about 60 to 80% of visitors, that we are lacking visitors, 30%, 20%, but that our visitors, our, our visitors is a local attendance. 
And mm -hmm. that means something to all of us. And the last thing I'm going to say is that because of our exhibitions in interior are closed, we decided to make exhibitions outside. We just commissioned the Congolese artist Sami Balochi to make public sculptures. We are going to work with Diana Velasquez of Colombia to make public sculptures. We are working with a Lebanese artist, Nael Ziata, to make public sculptures. So maybe there also we can reinvent something which we thought for a long time would be a kind of boring to talk about sculptures outside. Thank you. Thank you so much. And you've um, uh, introduced some of the topics, some of the crises that we want to get into in a little bit more depth in a, in a moment in terms of digital and representation and, and also the issue of audiences. Before that, I'd love to turn to our, our speaker here today who has the broadest overview. Hervé, Hervé Barbaré is CEO and Director General of Agence France Museum. Uh, prior to this, Hervé has served as the General Secretary at the French Ministry of Culture, and he has fulfilled numerous roles in French cultural life, including the Managing Director of the Musée de Louvre and the Director of the Mobilier National as well. And his extensive um, international experience also includes serving for three years in India as a commercial advisor for the French Embassy in New Delhi. I just wanted to mention that because, you know, we always see ourselves as particularly close to South Asia. So uh, welcome to you. Um, Hervé, I was wondering if your snapshot could extend to, to France in general, and if you could give us an insight into the kinds of decisions that, uh, you know, that governments have had to make uh, and, and individuals like you working at this kind of oversight level during this year. I don't think any of us have envied the kinds of decisions that you've had to make, but. If you could give us a little bit of insight, that would be great. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Antonia. Uh, I just wanted to say that all what our colleagues just said is, of course, very, very interesting. And I think that all these ideas uh, can give some uh, uh, perspective of all the decisions that have been made and that are to be made in the future. So just to put the stress on the fact that uh, Agence France Museum uh, uh, I'm CEO of is a cultural consultancy, which has been created uh, 13 years ago to uh, accompany the Louvre Abu Dhabi project, and today, which is also accompanying uh, other museum projects all over the world. So it's true that the current challenges are very, very interesting. Just to know what could be a museum in the future, and all what has been said um, today is really. Uh, uh, food for thought in, in that matter. And uh, it's true also that in France, uh, decisions, very tough decisions are, have been made, but uh, uh, in relation with all the decisions in, in Europe, and uh, I understand also in Africa, with what uh, Professor Bokum just said, that museums were closed. And uh, all what has been said about the works of art which were a bit offense, which were not uh, accessible, is of course, as we say in French, un crève coeur, and because our, our, our job, our endeavors in the museum uh, field is to have public able to, to have a, a sensory experience of the works of art. So uh, I, I would like to say that tough decisions had to be made and for sani obvious sanitary uh, reasons, but it's true for us, it's uh, a sad, sad situation. And uh, it has been said uh, largely. Uh, 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 from a, a very um, specific point of view in Abu Dhabi, uh, because Agence France Museum is in charge of producing four international level exhibitions a year for the Louvre Abu Dhabi. And in 2020, we had to cancel one exhibition to postpone two exhibitions. And only one exhibition took place and was uh, its duration was enlarged, but uh, it means that, you know, the program has been cut by uh, three quarters. Uh, so it's something which is also very difficult to organize and the consequences of cancelling or postponing an exhibition is not uh, always easy. What I, I would like also to insist on is that, and it has been said, of course, that in a period of crisis, it's always interesting to take stock of uh, the consequences uh, of such a, a situation. And about exhibitions, uh, this stock taking uh, exercise led us to some existential questions. 
when I say existential, it's to be very clear, are large exhibitions still relevant? What would happen if there was no more exhibitions, international exhibitions? That's, of course, a bit uh, tricky, uh, provocative, but I think it's important to ask this question. And second, there are the technical questions, meaning that can we think about new formats? Uh, can we think about uh, making uh, exhibition more in relation with the permanent collections? It's already the case, but uh, you know, sometimes exhibitions have been criticized because of the, uh, can I say, the blockbuster entertainment side of them rather than their relations to amplify the riches of the permanent collections. And on a more technical point of view, can we imagine new handling protocols, careers, uh, longer duration of exhibitions, these kind of technical questions. But I would like to, to point out the first existential question, which, which was, are exhibitions still relevant in a post-COVID world? Uh, I would like just to say that uh, the answer from my point of view is yes. First of all, because, and Chris uh, put the stress on that, there is no substitute to physical sensory experience of works of art. Mm -hmm. Of course, digital uh, tools can be a bit of a substitute or can uh, improve the experience of a visitor, but of course, when we are working in a museum or in the museum field, I, I strongly believe that we all share the idea that we are there for the public to have a sensory experience with works of art. So that's very important. And the second idea I would like to mention is that art is universal. So of course, we can rely basically on the permanent collections. But if we want everybody everywhere to have the chance to look at, to see uh, works of art from all over the world, uh, it means that exhibitions are, are, are of the essence, are, are crucial, definitely. And maybe just to conclude this point, I would like to insist on the, of the values that we have to share when thinking about exhibitions. Manolo just mentioned the idea of solidarity, and it's, of course, very important, but I think that when we think about museums and exhibitions, we have to think about also generosity, meaning that the works of art have to travel, to be seen. We have to think about meaningfulness. An exhibition has to be meaningful, to say something important. It's not just entertainment, it's something else, it's scientific. And uh, I would like also to insist on eco-friendliness, uh, and this we, we can maybe uh, have uh, to, to we go more in depth on, on that field. But just to sum up, most probably it's more eco friendly to have one work of art traveling to be seen by 10,000 people rather than 10,000 people traveling to see one work of art. So that's the point for uh, exhibitions. So just to say that this. Uh, symposium, this round table is very timely because uh, post-COVID world maybe is not something totally different from what it was before, but I think that also Chris mentioned that it is a trend amplifier. Most of the ideas we are sharing are not brand new, but the COVID crisis made these ideas, made these trends very important. So it's high time to end up them, to uh, tackle all these issues, uh, to address all these points. And of course, that's why I'm very happy that Louvre Abu Dhabi uh, organized this, uh, this uh, symposium and this room table to share ideas and experiences. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we should be mindful of time. Um, I'm afraid we've gone kind of way over, um, but everyone's been making fantastic points. Chris, did you want to jump in on something? I would like to uh, say something about what we all, I think we were saying, we need to be solidary, but I think we need to have um, a very concrete idea about solidarity. And for me, solidarity right now between museums 
is to fight a complete new trend, Hervé, which is a new trend, is that we are going back to a kind of renationalization. Renationalization because of the pandemic, we do things in our own country, in our own region, we cannot travel anymore. And I think we don't have to, um, we don't have to underestimate this, that some politicians are very happy with this idea of renationalization. So solidarity is also, I think, a very important way to overcome that new trend, which is, you know, brought to us by the pandemic, of course. Well, can I just, I mean, we're going off topic here, I know we need to talk about the digital, but just picking up on that point of yours, Chris, and thinking about um, what also that Elfe just pointed out about the, you know, incoming, or maybe it's very, it's present already, the kind of eco-crisis, you know, the, the idea that if we're going to travel less, yet be, um, you know, resolutely, anti-national nationalism and to sort of fight these uh, tendencies for sort of localized thinking. How can we create local institutions that engage on an international or kind of global level and that encourage those kind of debates and to boost this kind of interconnectedness um, that is obviously of crucial importance. I don't know whether, uh, just actually to pick up um, quickly on, I mean, for Hamadi, for Professor Boku, I mean, your, your museum is, has an S on the end, it's the Museum of, of African Civilizations. And so you're obviously already thinking of a, a museum that is rooted in Senegal, yet is addressing um, a continent and beyond, and given all the connections that you have internationally as well. So could you just, just for so one minute, because we really need to get around everybody, but just to give us a, a little response to that about how you're navigating the local in a global context, or in a regional and global context. Professor Hamidi, I think you're on mute. Écoutez, je... C'est bon? Bien, merci. Mm -hmm. Voilà, je, je pense que... Bon, je n'ai pas tout compris d'ailleurs, parce que je pense qu'il y a eu un, peu, un problème de traduction. Mais le problème de fond, c'est que nous, en réalité, euh, on n'a pas un problème de local ou d'international, parce que depuis le début, nous nous plaçons dans l'universel. Euh, parce que, en fait, notre musée qui est un peu, je pense qu'il est un peu atypique, euh, c'est un musée à thématique, nous n'avons pas de thème. Notre thème, euh, comme vous pouvez le constater sur notre site web, c'est la création continue de l'humanité. Nous pensons que l'humanité, c'est quelque chose euh, de très spécial, de très dynamique, qui se crée et se recrée tout le temps. Et l'humanité ne se crée pas en fonction des contingences que nous avons choisies, mais des contingences peut-être que nous avons choisies, mais de celles qui nous rattrapent aujourd'hui. La COVID-19 nous rattrape aujourd'hui. Euh, je pense que personne n'avait prévu ça il y a deux ans. C'est arrivé, il faut s'adapter, et c'est l'humanité qui se recrée. Donc, euh, en réalité, nous ne sommes pas tellement affolés par ce qui se produit aujourd'hui et ce qui pourrait se reproduire demain. Pour nous, ce qui est le plus important, c'est de comprendre le sens de l'histoire. L'histoire qui est en train de se jouer, Qu'est-ce qu'elle apporte de nouveau Et pour nous, ce que cette histoire est en train d'apporter de nouveau, c'est que dans le cadre de cette COVID, euh, en réalité, les, les, les relations entre les États, les humains, les nations, l'international, tout cela a changé. Dans les conditions normales, l'Afrique demandait de l'aide. On apportait de la nourriture, on apportait des soldats, on apportait ceci, on apportait cela. Aujourd'hui, chacun se bat pour sauver sa peau. Quand nous regardons ce qui se passe, par exemple, dans certains pays et ce qui se passe en Afrique, quand on voit comment les gens essaient de réagir pour sauver leur peau, ce qui est normal, et comment nous réagissons pour essayer de sauver notre peau dans les conditions locales, nous sommes en train tous de créer une nouvelle humanité. Aujourd'hui, j'ai regardé, au Sénégal, il y a eu quatre cas, quatre cas de coronavirus, quatre cas, non, pardon, sorry, huit, huit cas. Bon, il y a des pays qui seraient très heureux d'être dans la position du Sénégal aujourd'hui. Nous sommes très tristes de voir qu'il y a des pays où cette chose-là fait des ravages. Donc, euh, ce que je crois, c'est qu'aujourd'hui, le local n'a plus tellement de sens. Ce qui a vraiment du sens, c'est ce que nous pouvons faire ensemble. Et je crois que les musées, 
je crois que la culture a un rôle très, très, très important à jouer dans la gouvernance mondiale qui est en train de se faire. Euh, Aujourd'hui, ce n'est pas une question d'argent, ce n'est pas une question de ressources scientifiques et techniques, c'est vraiment une question de vécu. Comment nous allons vivre avec cette situation très, très compliquée Comment nous allons vivre avec un virus qui est certainement parti pour rester très longtemps parmi nous Et comment nous allons réinventer une nouvelle façon de, de vivre Je donne un petit exemple qui n'est peut-être pas révélateur. Mais au début, on nous a beaucoup parlé de distanciation sociale. Parmi les mesures barrières, on a parlé de distanciation sociale. Maintenant, tout le monde ne parle, personne ne parle plus de ça. On parle de distanciation physique. Ça veut dire qu'en fait, on ne peut pas mettre le social, on ne peut pas mettre l'humain à côté. Quelle que soit la complexité de la situation, l'humain doit toujours revenir au centre de la préoccupation, revenir au centre de la solution. Et je pense que l'humanité va vraiment réussir dans des délais beaucoup plus proches qu'on nous pouvons le penser aujourd'hui à régler cette affaire et à faire de telle sorte soit qu'on élimine la COVID-19, soit qu'on apprenne à vivre avec la COVID-19 comme nous vivons depuis des décennies avec la grippe ou avec le paludisme ici en Afrique. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Um, I can see, and I'm going to start weaving in some questions from the chat, so from the Q&A. So if people would like to add, please do. So I can see that there's a lot of support. If I pick up on the question from Mohamed Adel, from Elisa Bermar, there are a lot of people on the on the Q&A asking about the digital and also kind of, I guess, um, putting forward an idea that the digital can be this bridge that leads to a kind of internationalism within or, or combats the the growing nationalism of localization of museums and instead breeds an international conversation. Um, at this point, I wanted to bring in Manolo and then after that, Dr. Yang. So Manolo, I mean, if you've seen the uh, Guernica online, have you actually seen the Guernica? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, and, and if you allow me, I will, since I brought the solidarity word, uh, I would like also to comment on that. Uh, yeah, in terms of uh, when the pandemics came, I mean, I think we did, uh, something like everybody we went we went crazy with uh, all type of uh, uh, pu uh, putting all type of events uh, activities lectures uh, whatever i mean in, into the web actually uh, my team and myself when we were locked down we had i mean the, of course the galleries were empty but we had not the feeling that the museum was closed because there was uh, an activity and in that sense uh, let's say the digital, the Zoom, I think is important. I think it's also important in the sense that uh, it breaks, you know, this kind of uh, modernist male uh, colonialist uh, division between public and uh, private. As a matter of fact, everybody, everybody can see my office and can see that it's a mess uh, in the back. So uh, this is the way I work. So there is an element of intimacy uh, which I think is important. I think it breaks some, there is an element of fem, feminine because there was this division, the private is always woman, the public, the male. So I think that's also positive. But uh, as everybody, everything else, it has a dark side. The dark side is that maybe this privacy is colonialized. Maybe it becomes uh, just a part or just a way of uh, making a merchandise of everything. So that's one problem. Second problem is narcissism. I mean, I'm, I cannot avoid by looking at myself. I mean, I, I, besides the chat, I don't know, do not know the reaction of people. Uh, there is no performativity. There is no collectivity. I mean, there is an element material about the work so far, about the experience that somehow, uh, if we idealize the Zoom, the digital is totally lost. And I think it's very problematic. It could be even narcissistic and very authoritarian. So I think that's, uh, so my thing, my response is, yes, is, is important, is there to stay, uh, but it cannot be substituted. And then when it substitute, uh, substitutes uh, the experience, it becomes even silly. I mean, when you have uh, all these uh, substitutes of paintings, uh, doing silly things. I mean, it's not that I want to become elitist or anything, but it's just silly. I mean, I think digital things has uh, many, many other ways to, to, to deal 
with the work of art, with the archive, for example, in the case of Guernica, uh, one, uh, we have something called site Guernica, where it's not that we are substituting the painting, is that, for example, we have uh, the travels of paintings, of the painting, we have how the painting was uh, interpreted, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there is an element that only the web, only to put different images could could be there. And also there is something which I think is also positive, is when we were locked down, we were at the same time trying to work with the neighborhood because we, the museum is in a very poor uh, neighborhood and uh, trying to continue with the exhibition of Mondrian. And both things, uh, sometimes in a big museum, I mean, a big exhibition, very expensive, is top in the hierarchy. But in this case, everything was leveled down, everything. So I think that breaking of the categories is good. So as I said, these positive things, very negative things, we just have to be careful to keep uh, the distance. And then in terms of solidarity, I think the solidarity, it has to have different dimensions. It's not just a universal in the sense that it has to be solidarity towards other institution, call it generosity, call it the works do not belong to us. We are just custodians. That's one. It has to be solidarity against the biosphere, against other species. Otherwise, we really have, otherwise, we didn't learn anything from the COVID. Uh, I think it has to be solidarity, solidarity in relation to our workers. I mean, we should not forget that the cultural work is very, very precarious. So I think that's very important. And, and solidarity is linked to being situated. Being situated is not being local or not being uh, nationalistic. Of course, you speak from one place, but is uh, trying to decolonize that place. For example, uh, this museum is a national museum, but one of the major obligations of a national museum is precisely to give a platform to those uh, that do not have a nation. For example, the people in Spain that were in the exile, or for example, we have things in different languages, different national languages, Catalan, Spanish, Basque, all these languages have a territory, but what happens with the Romanese that do not have a territory? They are not part of. So I think this situated is critical with the local, critical with the national, and I think that's very important and it is linked to solidarity. Thank you. And I hope um, we had a good question from Dahmali, so I just wanted to, you know, that's obviously answered your question a little bit about the, you know, great museums which are obviously represented on this panel and the smaller regional ones which Chris also picked up on in talking about regional museums that are crucially important for their own towns and maybe we can reflect on that later about how to this kind of sense of internationalism within museums and the interconnectedness and the way museums can be radical in that sense of combating small thinking is something that we can come back to for regionals as well. Um, Dr. Yang, I just wanted to come to you now, um, just to finish up on the on the digital topic. Um, you know, multimedia, as you as you call it, within the Shanghai Museum, has been crucially important to you for many years. So, has this 2020 year uh, kind of accelerated your thinking when it comes to the digital, or are you also uh, similar to what Manolo was talking about, kind of thinking about the ways in which physical objects can never be replaced? By the, in, by the digital. Dr. Yang, I think you're on mute. So, yeah. yeah. Great, thank you. The digital uh, resources is very important, uh, can connect to with our future uh, exhibition. Yeah. Uh, for example, uh, Next year, we will uh, we will have a Chinese and Western porcelain exhibition at Shanghai Museum, which was original, uh, originally scheduled for this year. Uh, there will be many international loans from museums like Gumei, BNA, the British Museum, and the Met. Uh, there are uh, uh, equipment of digital, uh, uh, of porcelain uh, roof, porcelain roof uh, in in Spanish. Oh, okay, Spanish. Yeah, in Spanish. Yeah. Uh, so oh, no, 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 no. Uh, Portugal, Portugal. Uh, in Portugal. Uh, uh, Santos Palace. 
that was Paris. Uh, it's first time uh, we will uh, implement large equipment of digital. Yeah. Uh, and uh, as for future exhibition, I think we need to think outside the box and be more prepared. Uh, on one side, facing all uncertainties, it's important to have more flexibility when planning international big shoes. On the other side, we should turn in words that is to revisit, dig deeper into our own correction and uh, discover more potentials and the possibility in domestic resources. I believe that the exhibition in the future will definitely have more reflections on the whole world, on the links between different cultures, because the pandemic has shown us that we are actually more related to each other than we ever thought. In this dark time, museums should stand together and honor our commitment and expertise and uh, use the power of art and culture to connect, to heal, and to inspire. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we wanted to, just a warning, we have, uh, we have another 10 minutes left, uh, eight minutes. Um, we wanted to quickly touch on the uh, concept or the ideas around representation. Obviously, alongside the digital, the resurgence of debates around who is represented uh, via museum exhibitions, whose stories they tell, who owns the objects, and what decolonizing the museum actually means in practice have resurged this summer on the back of the Black Lives Matter movement and, and many kind of long-standing and, and existing debates within the museums. We also have a question from Francesca Bacci, who um, picks up on something that Manolo said about museums need to be situated and speak from one place. But she's saying, could this give museums a chance to reflect on whose story they have the agency to tell legitimately and on the cultural roots of their national identity? Um, and obviously, just over a, a month ago, I think France's National Assembly uh, voted to pass a bill returning 27 colonial era artifacts uh, from French museums, I think from mainly from the Musée du Quai Brandy to museums in Benin and Senegal. And I understand one of those objects is. Um, actually being hosted by um, uh, Hamadi's museum at the moment. So I wondered if we could just quickly, uh, maybe Hervé, Chris and Hamadi, could we just take one minute? I know we're not going to do this subject any service at all, but Hervé, just a, a one minute thought about that. And then on to Chris and on to Hamadi after. Sorry to yes. raise you. <laughs> That's definitely a, a mooted point, uh, which is not, not so easy to to mention in such a short time. I just would like to, to say uh, on that subject that uh, although, of course, uh, we have to take a, a, a very thorough look at, at this question of restitution, we have also, and I think it's Chris which mentioned that, to try to oppose the idea of identity politics, of communalism. Generosity means the works of art have to travel, to be shared, Everybody needs access to human creativity all over the world. So I'm afraid I won't go deeper in that subject because it's a very difficult subject. And I think a whole symposium could be devoted to that. But I just wanted to say that exhibitions, because it's really the topic of today, are a way to oppose identity politics and communalism, which is the opposite of generosity as a value of art, a value of the exhibitions, and the promotion of the fact that wherever you are, you have a right to access the genius of humankind wherever it has been produced. So the idea of exchange, of sharing, is the gist of the generosity, the solidarity we just mentioned, all this uh, during this, this round table. Thank you. Chris. Uh, we always talk about visitor numbers in terms of exhibitions. 
But what was interesting this morning was said in another uh, get together, in another exchange, also the collection needs a public. And I think if we take that as a point of departure, the collection needs a public, then we can, you know, look at restitution in a different way. There is another, for me, definition, which is becoming very important when you talk about exhibitions, when you talk about the work in the museum, that's the second thing. I always ask myself, and we have to learn that, is it necessary? Is it a contribution? And I think then we can also, you know, we can also talk about uh, what do we do with the collection? Is it necessary? Is it a contribution? That's, and the third uh, new thing, I think, which we learned and we should all learn is that through digital, we learned in another way to involve the public again. And the public has to be involved in one way or another with decision-making processes. To make an exhibition is a decision-making process. To make an exhibition in this or that way is a decision-making process. I, I'm not talking about collective curating. I'm talking about what uh, Manolo was uh, talking about, transparency in terms of modernity, to make things audible and to make things visible. And I think restitution can seen also in that way. So there are many reasons why we are now able to talk about restitution in completely different ways than before the pandemic. Also, and this is maybe very, very, no, not cynical, but I'm going to say it, some countries in Africa are doing much better with the pandemic than we do. Mm -hmm. Lesson learned. Yes, absolutely. We just heard, I mean, Hamadi just mentioned that. Hamadi, sorry, we have two minutes left, so can I give one to you and then I need to conclude, just to come back on uh, what Elve and Chris were saying. You're on mute. Chose en une minute. Un, sur la restitution. La restitution, euh, c'est important pour nous, c'est vrai qu'on doit rendre les choses, mais ce n'est pas seulement une question africaine. Le monde entier est, est concerné. Il faut certainement penser à avoir un instrument normatif au niveau de l'UNESCO pour régler cette question de manière globale. Ce n'est pas une question de paternalisme colonial, etc. etc. Le numérique. Pour nous, c'est une question très, très importante. Et depuis le début, le musée des civilisations noires a opté pour ça parce que nous sommes un musée qui a très peu de collections. Donc, le numérique et le virtuel dans l'architecture du musée, c'est inclus et nous travaillons sur ces questions-là depuis le début. D'autant plus que nous sommes dans une société où on lit très peu. Aujourd'hui, vous venez chez nous, on a travaillé avec Unifam. Tout est sur QR code. On n'a pas besoin de lire. On a toutes les informations avec son smartphone. Et c'est très important pour la circulation. La circulation des objets, ça coûte très, très cher. Le numérique permet vraiment de se passer de cette forme de circulation physique. La question de Black Lives Matter, c'est très, très important. Euh, nous l'avons sur notre site web et nous avons une affiche sur George Floyd. C'est tout aussi okay. important. Donc, euh, voilà, nous pensons que les musées, c'est la solution à la plupart des problèmes que nous rencontrons Inshallah, I think, sorry, but I think that's a, you know, a good uh, moment to end on. Um, I'm sorry, we, we had so much to talk about. It could have been the subject of five different panels. And thank you for your incredible insights and time. And sorry for the for the rush discussions on hugely important topics. I just wanted to finish by um, picking up on a few things that were said about now is the time for museum re uh, revolution and that we have, uh, you know, to develop a concrete solidarity between us. And this is something that's coming up in the chat as well. People really very much getting behind this idea. So thank you so much for putting that forward on day one of the conference. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Antonia. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Thank you, Antonia. Bye. 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 Bye.